You must ask one special favor of those who watch this program. Our traditional coyote stories should only be told or discussed during winter when snow is on the ground. The elders usually bring out the stories in November and put them away again when the snow is gone, usually by late February or March. Coyote stories, like other parts of our traditional way of life, are part of a seasonal cycle. By following this tradition, viewers can enjoy this aspect of our culture, keeping and saving something for the time of the year in which it belongs. Western scientific and indigenous approaches to understanding Earth are often similar but also different in several fundamental ways. Geologists attempt to explain, describe, and classify materials and processes, and they think of time as a linear sequence progressing from beginning to end. Traditional people often view and interact with landscapes in a different way. Traditional native perspectives and oral traditions document the close connections between people and landscapes, mountains, rivers, lakes, and other features. The native view is holistic and encompasses landscapes, animals, plants, and people, all of which are alive and deserving of respect. Processes happen in cycles rather than in a linear sequence of time. Tribal elders pass on knowledge through stories and oral history. The Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderé people often present the cultural perspective of the landscape on the Flathead Reservation through the telling of coyote stories. These stories portray complex and respectful worldviews in which animals lived on Earth prior to humans and made the world better for the eventual arrival of the human species. Because coyote made all of the landforms, local landscapes are culturally important to the Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderé people. Coyote stories are an important part of traditional teaching, but local cultural protocol reserves these stories for telling during the winter months. Teachers are asked to respect this tradition. One of the collaborative FGEP activities was a series of field trips with high school students, teachers, tribal elders, and SKC faculty. This program includes footage of these field trips, which we hope will serve as a valuable resource for teaching earth science in area schools. Both the traditional and scientific viewpoints recognize the unique topography of the Flathead Reservation. Salish, Ponderé, and Kootenai people explain the landforms through oral traditions involving a number of characters, including coyote, hawk, grouse, and a monster in Flathead Lake. Geologists talk about glaciers, glacial lakes, and moraines. The coyote involved in there. Usually he's the one that got rid of all the, all the monsters that when he come, when he come from, the, from the ocean start coming this way, you know. Just like the the monster that's, well, where the Arli area is, that, that's the monster himself. His heart, you've seen his heart on the hill? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, the coyote got rid of him. His face is down there by Ravala. You've seen that? Okay, but whenever you go through Ravala and you go around that corner in that little straight stretch, yeah. look straight, straight to that, there's a little, little rock ledge over there. You'll see his face in there. Oh, mm -hmm. right. But see, the coyote, coyote got rid of him. Mm. Because when he, when he came, because when he came from the, like I say, the from the ocean, mm -hmm. he came so far or, or by this river uh, Mike was talking about, and he stepped on a little bird. And by golly, this little bird just started kicking around there and, and he told the coyote, he said, I, I, had a, I had something to tell you, but since you broke my legs, I'm not going to tell you, you know. So the coyote said, well, wait a minute, maybe, because he had, he had uh, special powers at times. He was also mischievous, but still 
The Creator gave him special powers. He said, just, just hold on a minute. Maybe we can do something about that. So he got down there and sure enough, his, it was a metal lark. His legs were broken. Mm -hmm. So he reached in his pack and got some sinew. And he put some, I guess some papaw, some willows and wrapped. If you ever see a meadow lark on a fence post or something, look at his legs. Yeah. The marks are still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he splintered them. Mm -hmm. And he told him, now get up and try it. So meadow lark got up. Hey, he could walk. Mm -hmm. He was okay. He said, okay, I'll tell you. He said, when you go on down this, by this river, he said, and when you get so far down where the river is part, where this river meets the other one from the Jocko. He didn't say that, of course. He said, but where the rivers join? He said, you keep going. He said, be careful. There's a Natli Sked down there, a, a monster. Mm -hmm. He said, and he swallows everybody when you go in there. So Kayo said, okay, thank you, you know. So he started walking. He caught up there, and when he got to where the rivers join, he went so far and he pulled the tamarack out of the ground and he put it on his shoulder. Because, like I say, he had special powers. He said, now this monster ain't going to swallow me because I got this tamarack on it. He kept walking. Pretty soon he got so far down and he saw, gosh, there was a creature that was just about dead, real skinny. He looked around, there was some bones over here, some bones over there, and some other creatures that were just about dead. So he told them, uh, the, the, some of these creatures that could talk told him, what are you doing with the, the, the tree on your shoulder, you know? He said, well, I was told that there's a monster down here. And I thought, with this tree on my shoulder, he can't swallow me. I told him, you're too late, Sinjala. You're already inside of him. Oh. Yeah, so he looked around. <laughs> sure enough, he looked up. There was the, the monster's heart. There was the monster's lungs. His lungs had a lot of quail on them. And that's uh, grease on, around the, the membranes, whatever. Mm -hmm. And he got an idea. He told these, some of these creatures that were still alive. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about this monster. So he took his tamarack and he stuck it in the ground and he climbed up there took his flint knife out and he cut some of that grease off and he told these creatures, he said, you eat some of that. I want you guys to, to get some strength. See, he had special powers. So when they throw that grease down there, they start eating. Boy, pretty soon they come, some of the bones even come back to life somehow. But uh, he said, now he come back down and these, these creatures were, were lively again. He said, I'm going to go up there. Next time I go up there, I'm going to cut his heart out. He said, and when I do that, you know, he's going to be dying. He said, and all of you will have to get out however you can. Some this way, some that way. So he climbed up there again, took his flint knife out, and he cut around that heart. And that's when it dropped. It's, it's still up there on the side hill, on the other side of Arlie. And this monster started turning. And all the creatures start going out his mouth, out of the hind end, wherever they could get out. And the very last, that's why the ant, he's got a small waist. He had a rough time squeezing out, but he finally made it. And the and the, shkla, the bed bug, he barely made it out. That's why he's so flat. But that's the hind end is down by Evro, that, that canyon. And then his, his throat, his mouth is up here by Ravala. That's why his face is still there. But that's how Sinchile got rid of that monster. So, <laughs> and same way when you go down a Everett Hill, you know, you think about yeah. the monster. Now, there's places like that. That's you know, and uh, they got a place there in uh, Lolo landforms, you know, or rock forms, whatever it is. The stories about the coyote. So when you go through those places, then you you think about it. Not only that, but uh, pictographs too. Mm. When you go by it, you know you think about your ancestor, the one that did the painting. I wonder who he was. 
I wonder what his name was. And I wonder how old he was when he passed away. And you wonder how old he was when he got the power to write pictures, trying to tell a story to, to us, I guess. Maybe someday, I guess, we'll understand what they were writing about. That's the place that, you know, when we go by, we think about that. I guess that's connected to kind of a geology, I guess. But we don't look at it as a geology point of view. All of the mountains in the Jocko Valley area are composed of sedimentary bedrock that were originally deposited as clay, silt, and sand in a large inland sea approximately one and a half billion years ago. The land surrounding this body of water known as the Belt Sea was barren, expansive sand flats, and perhaps some mountains or hills. At that time, the earth did not support any land, plants, fish, or mammals. The only type of life that existed on the planet was single-celled algae. The combined thickness of these rocks is measured in miles. There is no record of any major geologic events on the reservation during the time gap between the deposition of the belt rocks and later formation of the Rocky Mountains approximately 100 million years ago. Such a gap in the geologic record is called an unconformity. Farther to the east during this period, vast seas covered central Montana and the interior of North America. Geologists theorize that either western Montana was well above sea level and that no deposition occurred, or perhaps that the geologic record was destroyed during the formation of the Rocky Mountains. Approximately 100 million years ago, tectonic forces began to dramatically change the western Montana landscape as collisions between the North American plate and small continents arriving from the west created compressional forces that formed the Rocky Mountains. The collisions caused the Earth's crust to buckle and break, resulting in major thrust faults. The belt rocks in particular likely moved along the fault about 50 miles eastward from where they were originally deposited. The intense heat and pressure caused by movement along the fault also metamorphosed the belt rocks. Approximately 50 million years ago, tectonic processes pulled the crust apart. This pulling apart created normal and strike-slip faults. Movement along the St. Mary Fault and the Jocko Fault, primarily downdropping of the valley floor relative to the mountains, created the Jocko Valley as we know it today. Approximately 15,000 years ago, during the last glacial advance, a segment of glacier filled the Pend Oreille Valley and extended across the Clark Fork River in northern Idaho, damming it and backing water up into the valleys of west central Montana. This body of water, known as Glacial Lake Missoula, filled the Jocko Valley and collected glacial sediments shed from the surrounding mountains. Evidence that shows that the, the sediments that are now up, up very high were underwater. And one piece of evidence for that is ripple marks, like you would find on a beach being created now, like on the shore of Flathead Lake. Uh, and those are preserved and have been preserved uh, according to geologists, for hundreds of millions of years. So, and now they're thousands of feet in the air. So mm -hmm. somehow they must have gotten from being down underwater to being that high up. Since the lake water had low energy compared to a river system, fine-grained silts were able to settle to the bottom and accumulate. A good example of Glacial Lake Missoula sediments can be viewed in a road cut on Highway 93 just north of Jocko Spring Creek. When Glacial Lake Missoula drained catastrophically, some of the water likely flowed through from the Missoula Valley through Evro Pass and then northward through the Jocko Valley. Since that time, modern streams like the Jocko River have cut down into the glacial materials and created their own floodplain systems. And when Arle was established, that was for Alik Demers. When he established Arle, he put the store there. 
his name was Alec Demers, and the Indians didn't say Alec, they just said Ali. That's mm -hmm. what my grandparents used to say. Ali got its name. The people didn't the study how the earth was formed, but they know where to go, where the game will be. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of, we don't wonder how, how, how the heck it was, how, how that mountain was formed. We don't do that, you know. That's the difference between you guys and Essex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that many of you notice that when you when you drive around this part of the state in western Montana, there's valleys separated by mountains. And uh, Louie here was just talking about McLeod Peak, right? It's several thousand feet above where we are now. So does anyone have any idea how we get that situation where we have narrow valleys and wide valleys separated by mountain ranges? The Jocko Valley right here is a pretty good example. I think Steve yesterday was giving you an introduction to geology of the reservation and uh, I think he mentioned a little bit about faults and uh, does anyone know what those are? We all have them. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Uh, think You can think of those as uh, cracks in the earth that result from tremendous forces that are generated inside of the earth. Well, you have kind of traditional maybe knowledge, which some people it's haven't kind of haven't said is yeah, science, kind of but it is very scientific. Like Mike was talking about, yeah. there there was a very intimate knowledge of maybe not the inner workings of of the crust and the mantle and the core of the earth, but there was intimate knowledge of earth processes and the relationship, where, right? Right. Yeah. And, and, and there was a deep deep yeah. connection through that, a deep understanding. Mm -hmm. That's what I use in science for like when you just said like sedimentary, metamorphic, igneous rock. <clears throat> There's all these stories mm -hmm. that tell how these rocks came to be or how the mountains came to be. Yeah. I use those stories in the science. Mm -hmm. all, they're learning science and they're learning the traditional stories. They're graded on the traditional knowledge, <clears throat> the knowledge that they're getting and the science part. But, you know, like, <clears throat> In the springtime, study the plants. That's all traditional use of plants, medicine, foods. Mm -hmm. That's all integrated into the curriculum. Mm -hmm.